So this project is about developing and trying to test some interventions to reduce gender bias in STEM fields particularly. And so despite great progress that we've made over the years in um, uh, reducing prejudice against women in STEM fields, we, we do have a long way to go. So what I'm going to show you are the um, 10 most recent Nobel laureates in physics. And as you can see, <laughs> they are all of the same gender. In fact, there have only been two women in the history of the prize in physics to win this award. The first was Marie Curie in the turn of the century. The more recent one was in 1963, which was um, Maria uh, Geppert Meyer. And um, yeah, so this is 1% of all Nobel laureates. And if we look additionally into existing uh, gender disparities among science and engineering um, faculty uh, on the x-axis are the Carnegie um, indications of the different types of institutions. And I'll just be showing you the proportion of uh, men versus women faculty in each of these groups. And so here you see for the men across all institutions and here for the women. And so it seems that there might still be an existing problem. And um, there's also a lot of empirical work showing that, that these disparities uh, still persist and have a lot of implications. So a study out of MIT has demonstrated that women faculty tend to have access to less lab space, their lab space is poorer, they're assigned to more committee work, and another, a lot of uh, other additional obligations that reduces their opportunity for scholarship. And female uh, women STEM students also experience, uh, report experiencing bias when they're in graduate school. And women are just generally uh, penalized across a lot of areas. So they're evaluated more poorly. They're less likely to be hired in the first place. They re receive less critical mentoring of their work and they're paid less. Uh, and we see this across a lot of different domains. So among psychology job candidates, mathematics candidates, um, um, abstracts, um, acceptance of abstracts amongst uh, in the, the field of communications, prospective doctoral student mentoring, and even um, in science lab manager applicants. And so for this last one, what Corinne and her colleagues did was send out applications, identical applications to R1 faculty in, um, I believe, biology, chemistry, and physics um, for uh, lab manager applicants. And they saw that when these applications were labeled as being from a woman, the uh, student was, report, uh, was evaluated to be less competent, less hireable, and less likely to receive mentoring. And um, importantly, and we'll see this across the current studies, we really see no effects of any demographic measures that we've used. So regardless of the faculty um, participants, gender, their age, their race, or anything else we had to use, um, these, these effects persist. So we see gender bias even amongst uh, women faculty members. And moreover, we even see pretty significant um, uh, salary disparities. So amongst these students, there was a 4,000 a year difference, and we know that because base salaries then are the basis for promotion, these disparities can um, get even larger over time. And so uh, Corinne, after doing this work with her team, said, how can we actually try to address this? And um, so the goal is to raise awareness that bias exists in STEM and to try to reduce it. And so I'll show you some examples of the, the intervention that she used, but, um, or we've all used, um, but there were two points that we really wanted to emphasize in these interventions. So one was to expose participants vividly to counter stereotypic exemplars, which have been shown to be effective in reducing bias in non-STEM related prejudice situations. And then also um, to, to engage individuals with um, engrossing media. So Betsy Levy Pollack has done this really successful in Rwanda, in her case with um, uh, soap operas, uh, radio soap operas, and reducing intergroup bias and conflict. And so we wanted to see, can we use such engrossing media ourselves to uh, reduce bias? And and so what Corinne and her team has done is develop 12 high quality videos and they partnered with professional playwrights and hired actors and directors and they wanted to communicate the results of actual published 
bias in research. So probably some of the research that you in this room have conducted yourself. And there are two primary conditions that we focused on. So one was the narrative condition. And in these six films, participants um, were shown videos of uh, in, in entertaining stories with compelling storylines and consistent characters throughout the films that were set in a, a, a science department. And in the intellectual condition, it was kind of a Diane Sawyer type interview situation in which professors who were also actors would just present the results of the research um, to an interviewer in a pretty straightforward fashion. Um, and so importantly, the underlying research that was presented in these two different conditions was always the same. It was either presented um, as an entertaining storyline or as an interview. And so let me just give you a couple of examples. Start. There we go. OK, um, a couple of examples of the articles that were used. So for example, um, one particular article uh, presented a finding that these gender stereotypes can uh, shape the letters of recommendation in ways that undermine women, right? That they write about women in ways that, that hurt their chances of being hired. And so in the intellectual condition, this was just reported by this fake professor. Um, in the narrative condition, uh, in a hiring decision case, uh, faculty were talking over letters of recommendation from uh, people who had applied for the position. And then there was also a control condition in which participants watched interesting science documentaries, um, which had equivalent number of men and women scientists. And those had been judged to um, be as entertaining as the narrative condition and as informative as the intellectual condition, uh, but it didn't include any bias in, uh, related information. And so in the first study, we recruited participants from the general population from MTurk. And in this study, we had two time points. So first, we uh, had participants respond um, to our dependent measures immediately post-intervention after they'd watched the videos, and then again a full six months later. And so the uh, DVs that I'd like to focus on today is the Awareness of Bias Scale, which is a validated published scale assessing um, awareness of bias against women. It includes items that now I don't have my note, that basically along the lines of, of um, women being evaluated more poorly than men for the same work and these kind of things on five point scales. And then um, to measure bias directly, we use the modern sexism scale, which is uh, frequently used to uh, ass assess modern, um, uh, the modern ways that sexism occurs against women. And so our hypothesis was, of course, that the, uh, both awareness of bias and sexism um, would be affected by these intervention movies uh, versus the control, but we didn't have a priori hypotheses about how the intellectual versus the narrative would, uh, how effective they would be related to each other. And so uh, first, these are the uh, post-intervention results. And as you can see, um, both the narrative and the intellectual condition did significantly better than the control condition in raising awareness of bias immediately after participants watched the video. Um, and so these were both uh, significant. In this case, the narrative and the intellectual did not differ significantly from each other. We did see a small amount of decay uh, six months later, but you can still see a trend in which the intellectual condition is doing better, and those, uh, those decays are not significant. And then for modern sexism, we see a similar pattern in which, um, in this case, specifically the intellectual condition reduced bias immediately following uh, watching the videos relative to the control. It didn't differ from narrative, and narrative didn't differ con from control. And we, uh, again, see some evidence of persistence of the effect six months later. So in this first study, um, we showed, especially um, immediately post-intervention, that these intervention movies were successful in increasing awareness of bias and reducing modern sexism. Uh, but we wanted to know, do these findings generalize? So of course, if we're interested in bias against women in STEM fields, we'd be interested in knowing how individuals in STEM fields uh, react to these videos. It might be that many people in STEM are already aware that these biases exist, so they might not even be effective in this population. And so in the second study, we basically conducted the same study again. We recruited um, uh, 
uh, faculty from across the United States who had been registered for the National Academy's um, Summer Institutes on Undergraduate Education. And in this case, we measured uh, participants at three time points. So first we got baseline measures, then one week later they were exposed to one of these interventions, and we got post-intervention uh, reports, and then we also measured them again one week later. And so um, with this design, we can both look at change from baseline per intervention. So did a particular movie improve awareness of bias relative to baseline, as well as the relative change across conditions? And so first you can see that both the narrative and the intellectual condition significantly improved awareness of bias immediately uh, post-intervention. And um, each of these conditions were significantly different from each other as well. And here, um, with a shorter time span, um, we, we see very strong uh, persistence of these effects one week later. And then for modern sexism, we see a very similar pattern where, again, um, the within subject change is significant for both videos, um, and the conditions are significant from each other, and these, uh, these effects persist over time. And so just to summarize, we see some evidence that these videos do increase awareness of bias against women in STEM and can reduce modern sexism. Um, and so where we'd like to go is first uh, to assess if we can, can actually move around implicit or automatic biases. And then in addition, uh, our team would really like to be able to disseminate these videos to uh, training diversity training groups with appropriate instructions to actually try to improve this in the real world. And um, so this leads us to ask, okay, well, what videos should we use? We see some evidence of, of both of them being effective. It seemed like the intellectual was doing better, especially for the scientific community. Um, but with some mediators that I don't have a chance to discuss today, um, we do see that the, these two types of videos are very different. So, um, the narrative videos were found to be more engaging. Uh, people felt more transported when they watched the videos, whereas the intellectual ones, people felt like the information was presented in a more clear and logical manner. So it might be that um, you have a training session where people are getting a little bit bored. It might not hurt to add some of these narrative videos in. They might also be more likely to be disseminated informally. Um, but maybe you already have engaging activities, but just not a lot of facts, and so the intellectual videos are a really great way um, to share our scientific findings about gender uh, to a broader community. And so I think in closing, uh, we recognize that, that these biases are, are keeping certain members of our community from, from really contributing to science at their full capacity. That hurts everyone. And so hopefully these interventions are one step to try to reduce this and really help our scientific community work at its full capacity. And so with that, I'd like to of course thank Corinne for involving me in this awesome project as well as our other collaborators, Eva, Jack, Tori, and Joe, uh, our funding sources and the great team of RAs at Skidmore that have been helping us with this as well. So thank you very much.